Hey, how's it going, brothers and sisters? Uh, the title of today's message would be Methuselah's End Time Timeline, The Turnkey Event. And the reason why I'm presenting this message to you is because I was uh, going through the Word of God to uh, create another intercessory prayer warfare strategy. And I came across the next set of scriptures that I would be tapping into with God. But God revealed something else and brought another thing to my attention that I remembered he showed me some few years ago, but it wasn't time for me to really speak on it because I didn't have the full maturity yet, the spiritual maturity yet to understand what the Lord was saying, as well as um, the way to properly convey it. So this way it's the Lord. I'm trying to like, you know, speak of the matter from the Lord's perspective and not my own. Because the worst thing that we can do when we do any message is speaking from our own accord. Because when we speak from our own accord, that is when we make the greatest mistakes. Because we allow our human nature to get involved in a thought process in a way that things are interpreted and we're always wrong. And so now that I'm learning to be yielded to the leading of God, to not do anything unless God tells me to or not think on the matter unless the Lord gives me the thought on it, it makes it more easier for me to present the information with the perspective of his heart. So what we're going to look at here is the life of Methuselah. Now, we know that in the scripture, there's not much spoken of the life of uh, Methuselah. It's very short in nature. But yet there's a lot of information to truly glean from it if you allow the Holy Spirit to lead you through the process. And so now we're going to cover this briefly and see a very important end time message concerning the life of Methuselah to help us understand what we shall soon see in our time. And now in this next slide, what you see in front of you as the headline is Methuselah's Lifeline. So this here is a representation of Methuselah's life from day zero to 969 when he died. So using his life as a reference, we're going to be able to pull some specific important messages and uh, words a wisdom which will help us to understand a deeper message that the Lord is seeking to convey to us concerning the time in which we are living in. And so going to day zero, it says Methuselah is born. And this is out of Genesis chapter 5 verse 21. And it says that Enoch lived 60 and 5 years and begat Methuselah. And in the next slide, we have the year date of Methuselah's life, 187. So when he was 187 years old, he gave birth to Lamech. And this is in Genesis chapter 5, verse 25. And it says, Methuselah lived 180 and 7 years and begat Lamech. And so when Methuselah was 369 years old, his son Lamech gave birth to Methuselah's grandson, Noah. And so when we do the math, right, uh, Lamech gave birth to Noah when he was 182 years old. And so 182 plus 187 give us the number 369. This is why we know that uh, Methuselah was 369 when his grandson Noah was born. And then when we go to Genesis chapter 5 and verse 28, it says, And Lamech lived 180 and two years and begat a son. And he called his name Noah, saying, This same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. So what is interesting is that in the birth of Noah, Lamech knew that, you know, through the spirit, that is, that Noah was a special child. He may not have fully understood the significance that Noah would play in the years to come, but he knew that Noah would be a type of deliverer for the situation in which they were in. And not only that, but a comforter to them. And so when, um, when Lamech gave birth to Noah, Methuselah was still alive. So both of them um, knew Noah and more than likely had an understanding that something was very special about this child. And in the next slide, we're at when Methuselah was 849 years old. And so when he was 849 years old, Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 through 3 took place. And it says, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, 
My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be in hundred and twenty years. So when Methuselah was 849 years old, that's when the 120 year countdown began. And so this number 120 will also be significant when it comes to the life of Moses. And so another thing I want you guys to take away from this is when the Lord says, my spirit shall not always strive with man, because the Lord will mention this once again in Isaiah chapter 57. And now in the next slide, when Methuselah was 962 years old, Lamech dies. So Methuselah actually outlived his son Lamech. This, I believe, is the first time in the genealogy of the pre-flood era from Adam to Noah that you have a father that outlived his son. Other than, other than the uh, time of which Cain killed Abel, but we're talking about a full life being lived out where they died a natural death. So this here is like the first iteration where um, we have a father who outlived a son who died of natural cause. And it's very interesting too that the number of years of Lamech's total life was 777. And it kind of brings back to my mind about the fact that we just passed through the year um, 5,777, 5,000, I'm sorry, 5,777 on the uh, Hebrew calendar. What is also interesting about that is that in the Hebrew calendar, we actually transition from 5,777 and the scripture that references the total number of years of Lamech's life was in Genesis chapter 5. So you have the year 5777 and then Genesis chapter 5 going to verse 31 and it says all the days of Lamech were 770 and 7 years and he died. So why I find this to be interesting is the fact that when we look at the entire history of mankind after the post flood era, there has been no time like the one in which we are living in now where we're living so close to the very end and so when we look at Methuselah's timeline it ends at 969 and Methuselah son Lamech dies at 962 so it was so close to the end of Methuselah's age and so now in the next slide Methuselah dies at the age of 969 he outlives his son Lamech by 192 years. So Lamech died when Methuselah was 962 years. And then what I find very interesting about this with another end time highlight is the fact that it was seven years later in which Methuselah died. So seven years after the loss of his son Lamech, we have the death of Methuselah. So why is this important? Well, we'll find out in the next slide. So not only did Methuselah died at the age 969, but also in that same year is when Noah entered into the ark. And so why did Noah enter into the ark? Because that is the same year in which the Lord was sent the great flood for 40 days. Because from the time that Methuselah, if you look on the chart, from the time that Methuselah was 849 years old, there was a 120 day countdown to the judgment of God. And so when you do the numbers, right, you count, you add up the numbers, 849 plus 120, that leads to the year of Methuselah's life of 969, in which is the same year in which he died. And so how old was Noah? Uh, when the flood finally came down upon the inhabitants. Well, if you go to Genesis chapter 7 and verse 6, it says, And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. And so when you do the math here, if you do 969 minus 600, 
it lands us to the accurate dates of 369 of Methuselah's year when Lamech gave birth to Noah. So if you see, if you pay attention here, you see a pattern that the Lord is doing with the righteous genealogy from Adam to Noah, where Lamech, his life was cut short. He didn't live the full life like many of the other, um, of the other righteous genealogy lived. But he and his life, it was cut short to 777 years. Many would say that um, he didn't live out that full life, which was the compared to the average lifespan of those from his same genealogy. However, comma, Methuselah, he was permitted to live out his entire days all the way up to the point when the Lord was about to bring the judgment of floodwaters upon that wicked generation. So this here was a merciful act that the Lord did in the life of Lamech, who died seven years before the flood, and a merciful act for uh, Methuselah, who died in the year in which the Lord would finally send the flood. This right here, brothers and sisters, the Lord is sending a powerful message to the body of Christ of how he is orchestrating and how he will go about the bringing about the final judgment as stated in the scriptures where it references the days of Noah. And in this segment of our message is going to be a longer aspect of it simply because of the fact that we're now going to be diving in to scripture in a more detailed fashion to bring out the nuggets to throw proof upon what you see before you to have an understanding and the way God's heart is operating the ways of God the way that God is moving out and bringing about his end time plan where he shall redeem all of creation back onto him so when we go to Genesis right it says uh, from Genesis 6, 1 through 14, but we're going to break it down into like two halves. It says, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Right? Yet his days shall be in hundred twenty years, and there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. This is where we get the whole mythological concept of demigods, like Hercules and all that stuff. All that stuff was driven from the corruption that took place, as stated here in Genesis 6 chapter 4. This is where we get all of our Greek uh, uh, mythologies and stuff like that from this very scripture, brothers and sisters. And then we go on to verse number five and it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So, and it says, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. So, brothers and sisters, Cain killed Abel and violence began to increase upon the earth. But judgment did not come upon the people at that time. No, but what happened here specifically was the direct involvement of these fallen angels as they mingled in the affairs of mankind and the many perversions as stated here which um, resulted in the hearts of man becoming hardened to the point where there was no chance of them to repent and why is that important it's important because many of us are trying to predict when God is going to bring down judgment, but we don't understand the requirements of God. We don't understand the heart of God and what would lead him to bring about this global destruction. For even though that the angels were mingling in the affairs of man, the Lord had to do one last critical check to see if he would do what he would not, what he would rather not do, um, in which he would rather people will repent. And the answer to that is in Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 and it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, right? And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only 
evil continually. What it means here is that the Lord searched the hearts of the people of the earth, and there was not a glimmer of light. There was not a glimmer of hope. There was nothing in the heart of the people that showed that there was a chance that they could repent, that there was a chance that they can get saved. And the reason why that the wickedness of man became so great was because of the direct involvement of the fallen angels. The fallen angels were the key ingredient which helped get man to that state of corruption and wickedness in their hearts. Because if you think about it, in our time, there has been many great and wicked things that, ha that man has done against one another, but it never moved the hand of God to bring about a global judgment. But it wasn't. But when you see here, when the fallen angels got into the mix and began to do wickedly with mankind, they were able to get man's heart to the point of such hardness and darkness where continually they thought of evil and there was no glimmer of light in which the Lord knew that there was no hope for that generation. And so the Lord said that he would bring about that judgment in 120 years. And so when we think about our current age, the beast that shall impose his mark upon mankind would be the equivalent of Genesis 6 fallen angels direct involvement in corrupting man's hearts. Now I don't know the details of what this mark of the beast will entail and how the fallen angels will be mingled in the mix, but we do know that in the scripture it says that to take the mark of the beast is to eternally condemn yourself. So therefore, this mark will have to do something to our heart to the point where there is no glimmer of light to where God can see a chance of repentance where it will put us beyond the ability to repent and be saved. And so this is a danger that we have coming in our direction concerning the mark of the beast which shall indeed lead the way and creating the atmosphere as it was in the days of Noah. And as we move on in scripture, Despite the great wickedness that the Lord saw upon the earth as he searched to and fro, he was seeking for the hearts of those who had a glimmer of light to repent, a glimmer of light to be able to receive the salvation of God. None was found. But then we go to verse 8, which gives us that glimmer of hope to a story that seemed to have a tragic ending. It says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So it means that Noah may not have been the perfect man, but in his heart, he found grace before the Lord. For it says in verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. And Noah was just a man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. So in verse 9, it says that Noah was just a man. There's nothing special about him, but in his generation, to the standard of wickedness which was occurring at that time, he was found perfect and he walked with God. As I said again, it says he was just a man. Doesn't mean that he was perfect, but he clung to God and walked with him. This is important for us, for us, brothers and sisters, to be able to navigate through the tough times that will soon be upon us. And in verse 10, it says, And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. This will be a major thing that we will see in the coming days is an increase of great violence as we move to the days of Noah. And God looked upon the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. For it says all flesh had corrupted its ways, which means that there was a proactive action that was taken on a part of man to create that atmosphere in their, in their hearts to be in complete corruption. <clears throat> and it says, And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without the pitch. And then the Lord goes and gives specific instructions as to how this ark will be built. And so when the Lord commanded Noah to build an ark, understand, brothers and sisters, that today the Lord is commanding you to be as Noah and build your ark so you may be found worthy to escape all these things that shall come upon the earth. So what instructions has the Lord given you in your life to build this ark to be found with your heart right in this generation 
to escape all these things. And then when we go down to verse 17, it says, And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy son's wife with thee. So you see here, brothers and sisters, that when the Lord will make a quick work on the earth, understand that it will not be the end of the earth. It will not be what many of these Armageddon extremists will show that there's a complete explosion of the earth and there's no more earth or anything like that. Because of the fact that Noah was around, because of the fact that Noah was found to be walking with God and was upright in his generation, the Lord found somebody that he would make a covenant with and crossing over into the new land. And so therefore, brothers and sisters, the Lord is looking for his people in which he will be making a covenant with in this generation that shall go forth into the new land that shall be used to bring in the new era to come, the millennial era. And it says, And of every living thing of all fish, two of every sort shall thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female. So understand that if the Lord has chosen you to be the one he shall make a covenant with and bringing in the millennial reign through the things he would do upon the earth, he shall bring many different people of many different kinds and many different backgrounds to you and you will have a charge to keep them alive through the living word of God. So you must prepare yourself to be a leader for the different types of personalities, the different types of backgrounds, and the different types of people that the Lord shall be leading to you. For not a single person will be left out. When we go to verse 20, it says, Of fowls after their kind, and of the cattle after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind. Two of every sort shall, shall come unto thee to keep them alive. So be prepared for the, the mixture of people that the Lord will be sending your way to help them navigate the time to come. And take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be food, uh, it shall be for food for thee and for them. Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. So this food that the Lord speaks of here is the word of God. For the Lord said, Man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So you must prepare the food for the ark by knowing your words, brothers and sisters. And so now as we look at the notes that I have here to make sure I highlighted all the key things, it says, Noah was born into what was known in his time as the last generation of that era. In that generation, he was found perfect before God and would be permitted to enter into the new post-flood era to come. Lamech and Methuselah were alive to see the progressive downfall of men into their lawless state. As you look on the graph, brothers and sisters, Lamech and Methuselah were around. However, they were not born into that last generation company, but were from a different, older generation. Methuselah, at a minimum, not only saw the decline of mankind, but also the salvation of the Lord through Noah and the ark. So why do I say Methuselah? It's because the ark was built between 849 and 969 of Methuselah's life. It doesn't state in scripture how long it took to build the ark, but we know that there was a 120 year countdown at Methuselah's 849 year mark. So anywhere between that time frame, the ark could be built. And we don't know if Lamech was around because he died a good seven years before the flood occurred. But we do know that Lamech saw Noah and knew how special Noah was. And that through Noah, the Lord is about to work salvation for, the, for all mankind. And so when we continue to press down, it says... Um, Methuselah and Lamech would not be permitted to cross over into the new world for they died before they before then, right? They died before judgment. But they witnessed the mighty handiwork of God giving hope to man that there will be a chance to get things right in the world to come. And so the Lord commenced the redemption of mankind from that fallen state in 849 
of Methuselah's life and concluded it in 969 when he put an end to sin of that era and delivered Noah from the land of corruption into a land with a fresh beginning. It's kind of like the story in Israel with the Israelites, how Moses took him from the land of corruption and bondage in, e in Egypt and brought him into a new land flowing with milk and honey. And understand this, brothers and sisters, that it took 120 years for this to occur. So let's take a look at Deuteronomy 34. And in regards to the significance of the number 120 that we just learned in Genesis chapter 6. And it says, And the Lord said unto him, this is the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. So when you see this, right, put yourself in Methuselah's place or Lamech's place and picture the parallel that's happening here, how and the way that Moses is able to see the land or know what the Lord is about to do shortly. But yet Moses would not be permitted to go over. Methuselah saw what the, what the Lord is about to do, do through his seed, which is Noah. But yet he and Lamech would not be permitted to cross over. And in verse 5 it says, So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor. But no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. And in verse 7, it says, And Moses was an hundred and twenty years old when he died. His eyes was not dim, nor his natural force abated. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab thirty days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And Joshua, who is a type of, of Noah here, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him. And the children of Israel hearkened unto him and did as the Lord commanded Moses. So in the 120 years, so in the 120 years, the Lord pronounced uh, upon the world judgment. And so he would have Noah build an ark that would carry the inhabitants upon the waters into that new land. And when we look at the life of Moses, Moses received that name because he was drawn out from the waters in the ark that was prepared for him in a time of persecution. When we go to Genesis chapter, well, not Genesis, but Exodus chapter 1, we learn about the story of his mother and then how his mother built a type of basket for Noah to escape the decree of Pharaoh. And when he was upon the waters, he was guided to where uh, Pharaoh's daughter resided. And when Pharaoh's daughter pulled him out of the water, she said, And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses, and she said, Because I drew him out of the water. So Moses was 120 years old when he died, full of life. Full of life. Full of years. And when Moses was pulled out the water, he was given that name because he was drew out of the water, kind of like a reference to Noah. And so the notes I have here says the birth of Moses marks the 120 year redemption plan for the people of Israel. And this time he would be used by God to create the Ark of the Covenant in the same way Noah was used to make an Ark in which a covenant would be would come from that shall carry the people of Israel from a land of corruption to a new land of promise. So now there is this type of Noah Moses effect happening here, showing a bounce off in the parallel of an end time event, of an end time story. And so Lamech and Methuselah was from an older generation and would not go over into the new land in Noah's day. It would be Noah that would lead that new generation into the new world. And so when we look at the story of Exodus, Aaron and Moses was from an older generation and they too would not be permitted to cross over to the new land. It would be Joshua that would lead the new generation to the land of promise. And so now we're going to jump into this next slide and speak of the, the seven year time frame. And so looking at this, Lamech's life, though long in years, was cut shorter than the average of his ancestors. Lamech died before his father Methuselah. And this, as I mentioned before, was the first time in which this occurred in the genealogy from Adam to Noah. Methuselah died in 969 years of life, which is the same year as the flood. 
Lamech and Methuselah were taken before judgment fell and lived a life full of years. This was an act of mercy from God. And so there was seven years between the two deaths. It makes you wonder about how this can reference the seven year tribulation and about the people of God being here towards the end of it when the Lord would send his final judgment. And so the final judgment only fell when the last righteous line of the older generation died. The Lord permitted Methuselah to have full years and full of life. Why is this important, brothers and sisters? If you take, if you understand that the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that he is unchanging, and his principles stand the same, they understand that in this current generation where we're saying that judgment is going to fall on this day and on that day, bear in mind that the Lord have many righteous saints from older generations that has faithfully served them that continues to remain upon the earth. Just take the time right now and think of the many names you could come up with from the top of your head. The Lord did not allow the judgment to fall upon the earth until Methuselah and Lamech were taken out of the way. So they would not have to see the judgments that will fall upon the wicked generation. So if the Lord used the same principle, and this is his heart, right? If the Lord used that same principle during that time, and the Lord says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man, then it means the same principles that govern the decisions of his heart still rest in even today's situation. So the Lord will not bring about this judgment until there is a removal of his righteous ones who's faith, who faithfully served him who faithfully did what the Lord called them to do from an older generation that knew not of the wickedness that came into being now. The Lord will show mercy upon them. And how are we sure of this? Isaiah 57. It says, The righteous perisheth, and no man layeth it to heart. And merciful men are taken away, none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. So they will not see the judgment of God fall, but, that, but they shall transition from this life to life eternal, walking in the peace that they knew and in the uprightness that the Lord has established in them. And so Lamech and Methuselah were taken away before the judgment of God fell upon the wicked generation. They were spared from experiencing this. It is an act of mercy from God to take away the righteous in our current age that we're living in before his terrible judgment falls. So once the Lord's people is moved out of the way, he will deal with the wicked generation. And so we just read the first two scriptures of Isaiah 57. And so in wrapping up the study, I leave with you with what the Lord has entailed to come. And it says, But draw near hither, ye sons of the sorcerers, the seed of the adulterer and the whore. Against whom do you sport yourselves? Against whom make ye a wide mouth and draw out the tongue? Are ye not children of transgression, a seed of falsehood? Inflaming yourselves with idols under every green tree, slaying the children in the valleys under the cliffs of the rock? Among the smooth stones of the stream is thy portion. They, they are thy lots, even to them hast thou poured a drink offering, thou hast offered a meat offering. Should I receive comfort in these? Upon a lofty and high mountain hast thou set thy bed, even thither wentest thou up to offer sacrifice. Behind the doors also and the post hast thou set up thy remembrance, for thou hast discovered thyself to another than me. And art gone up, that hast enlarged thy bed, and made thee a covenant with them. Thou lovest their bed where thou uh, sawest it. And thou wentest to the king with ointments, and didst increase thy perfumes, and didst send thy messengers far off, and didst debase thyself even unto hell. Thou art wearied in the greatness of thy way. Yet saidest thou not, there is no hope. Thou hast found the life in thine hand. Therefore thou wast not grieved. And of whom hast thou been afraid or feared? that thou hast lied and hast not remembered me, nor laid it to thy heart. 
Have not I held my peace even of old? And thou fearest me not? I will declare thy righteousness and thy words, for they shall not profit thee. When thou criest, let, they, let thy companies deliver thee. But the wind shall carry them all away. Vanity shall take them. But he that putteth his trust in me shall possess the land, and shall inherit my holy mountain. And thou shalt say, Cast ye up, cast ye up, prepare the way, take up the stumbling block out of the way of my people. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirits of the humble, and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. For I will not contend forever. This, brothers and sisters, is out of Genesis 6. Neither will I be always wroth, for the spirit sh should fail before me, and the souls which I have made. For the iniquity of his covetousness was I wroth, and smote him. I hid, I hid me, and was wroth, and he went on frowardly in the way of his heart. I have seen his ways, and will heal him. I will lead him also, and restore comforts unto him, and to his mourners. I create the fruits of the lips. Peace, peace to him that is far off, and to him that is near, saith the Lord. And I will heal him. But the wicked are like the tro troubled sea, when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up myrrh and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. And so, brothers and sisters, I leave you with this general guide of what we can see happening in our day. Man shall achieve a fallen state to that which was in the days of Noah through the help and intervention of fallen angels. The generation of Noah's shall be building their spiritual arts, preparing to escape the judgments to come. There would be a combination of righteous people dying in a short period of time. This would include many that has lived a full life as Methuselahs, and those whose lives would be cut short as Lamech, but lived a good life nonetheless before the Lord. Then great judgment shall fall upon the wicked, as it was in the days of Noah, when Noah entered into his spiritual ark. And then there would be the birthing of a new beginning, and a fresh land delivered from corruption. And this will be the millennial kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, thank you all for listening, brothers and sisters. I pray that you was blessed by the hearing of this message. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, feel free to uh, post it, and then I'll get back to you the best way that I can. I love you all.